I wanted to begin uh, before I introduce Her Excellency by explaining that um, because her biography is so large, I am going to do a disservice and not read all of it. But before I do that, I wanted to say, there's a reason why Africa is uncompetitive when it comes to inventing things and producing the goods that we require, be it in manufacturing or mining. We do not spend enough money and resources on research and development in part because we have not paid enough attention to the STEM subjects. And I think all of us know this. We are changing though, and today is but one example of that. The fifth Baba Kandiaya lecture is honored to host Her Excellency Amina Gurib Fakim, the first president, the first female president of Mauritius and a science doyen recognized all around the world. We well, thank you for being with us today. And I'm just going to give a few of the accolades and uh, the places where you have been at to share with our audience today. As I said, she was the first female president of Mauritius, 2015 to 2018. And prior to that, she was managing director of the Center for International Development Pharmaceutique, Research and Innovation, as well as a professor of organic chemistry with an endowed chair at the University of Mauritius. Since 2001, she has served success, successively as Dean of the Faculty of Science and Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Surrey, UK, PhD from University of Exeter, at which she began working at the University of Mauritius. Between 1987 and 1992, she served as project leader for the first regional research project on the inventory and study of medicinal and aromatic plants of the Indian Ocean, funded by the European Development Fund. And so the list goes and on and on and on. Your Excellency, allow me to cut short that introduction and take you to the floor. And thank you once again for joining us this afternoon and sharing your immense knowledge. Can I start the video? Yes, ma'am. The, the host, uh, I think is, uh, I, I cannot start the video. The host has to do it. Okay, I am waiting start for them video. to do so yeah. right away. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is an honor and a great privilege to be delivering the fifth annual Babaka NDI lecture to such a distinguished community and audience. I would like to thank Professor Benedict Orama, president of the Afraxin Bank, and Dr. Hippolyte Fokak for associating me with this important event. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa starts with a considerable deficit in spite of its natural advantage and huge asset endowment. The continent of ours is about 30 million square kilometer, representing 20% of the Earth's surface. She's home to 1.3 billion people, representing 17% of global population, targeting 2.5 billion by 2050, and also home to sway the forest, minerals, among so many riches. Yet, the continent produces only 3% of global GDP, accounts for less than 3% of global trade, and most of it is dominated by primary commodities and natural resources, and carries 25% of the global disease burden, accounts for only 2% of world research output, 1.3% of research spending, and 0.1% of patents. How can a continent with the largest share of the world's arable land, 60%, a continent with the youngest population, a continent that has fueled all of the world's industrial revolution, a continent that has helped drive the mobile phone industry, a continent that is at the cusp of supporting the world's energy transition to greener technology, with her large store of rare earth mineral deposit, accept such dismal statistics. Our challenges, ladies and gentlemen, are fundamental and structural. The deficit of investment in science and technology and absence of economic and scientific infrastructure for innovation have undermined the process of economic transformation, both at the structural level, shift of workers, and resources from low to high productivity sectors 
and at the sectoral level, the growth of productivity within sectors. The consequences of that deficit have been significant and include continued reliance on the colonial development model of resource extraction, largely responsible for the debilitating poverty trap and aid dependency trap. But these challenges have been compounded by economic fragmentation with smaller markets constraining long-term investment and injection of patient capital to foster innovation and drive technology transfer in the context of globalization. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement, AFCFTA, which defragments Africa to establish the largest single market in the world by membership, and created the conditions for safe scale also lifts one of the most important constraints on the path of economic transformation. By meeting that challenge of economic transformation, a development objective that has eluded Africa for decades in the AFCSDA era hinges on Africa closing its scientific and technological gap with the rest of the world and sustainably producing the right set of skills to address the supply side constraint and ultimately expand both extra and intra-African trade and sustain higher rates of growth to accelerate the process of global income convergence. Currently, we have a public education system that prescribes rote learning rather than the independent critical analysis and thinking that is needed to succeed in knowledge intensive economies. That system has neglected the sciences, which have, ha which have been the major drivers of growth and innovation for decades. Just a few statistics for illustration. According to the World Intellectual Property Indicators 2020, offices located in Africa received 0.5% of all patent application filed worldwide, compared to 65% in Asia. 20.4% in North America and 11.3% in Europe. According to UNESCO, Sub-Saharan Africa was home to only 0.7% of world's researchers as of 2018, representing 14% of the global population. 13 out of the 20 underperformers in terms of research per million of people are based in Africa, with as little as 11 researchers per million people for the worst performers, and most, this is of course the most recent data. In comparison, outperformers such as Denmark, Sweden, Korea respectively have 8,066, 7,980, 7,536 researchers per million people. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest dream of most African graduates is to find a job instead of fostering entrepreneurship and drawing on their creativity and animal spirit to find solution to economically rewarding problems. And we have so many across our continent. In the medical and pharmaceutical industry and the COVID-19 crisis has shown in the housing and urban development as our cities illustrate, in the climate space as our excessive reliance on import of refrigerators and air conditioning illustrate in the energy sector, the chronic deficit of power across the continent, including in South Africa, the most sophisticated economy in the region illustrate. However, the AFCFTA that aims to unlock manufacturing potential, drawing on the rules of origin to facilitate industrialization, driving sustainable growth and jobs, among other objectives, will need a different set of skills to fully deliver on its full transformational power. The key boon of manufacturing is that it absorbs large swathes of workers and places them into productive and decent paying jobs. Throughout history, this exact recipe has transformed the United States, United Kingdom, France, Japan, Germany into some of the world's wealthiest nations. Most recently, a new age of industrialization has helped push China into one of the world's fastest growing economies, boasting the largest middle class with other Southeast Asian countries following closely behind. 
These are all examples of how industrialization can generate rapid structural change, drive development, and alleviate poverty and unemployment. However, this narrative seems to exclude many African nations. Despite the manufacturing potential and promising trajectories, most African countries have remained largely dearth of factories. This limited industrial development represents a missed opportunity for economic transformation, characterized by the expansion of manufacturing output in a context of a strategic shift of workers and resources from low to higher productivity sectors through the more entry and growth of technologically intensive firms and sustained effort to foster innovation in the higher productivity sectors. The silver lining is the potential. Business to business spending in manufacturing in Africa is projected to reach 666.3 billion US dollars by 2030, 201.28 billion more than it did in 2015. Africa is also set to become the great manufacturing center, potentially capturing part of the 100 million labor intensive manufacturing jobs that will leave China by 2030. This trend creates a huge opportunity for the continent, not only for countries such as South Africa, Egypt, and Nigeria, all regional ad performers in the Global Manufacturing Competitiveness Index, but also for new players such as Ethiopia, Morocco, Rwanda, and others, all of whom have recently adopted policies enabling manufacturing and industrial development. Today, leaders are increasingly realizing that manufacturing is a major factor in helping Africa realize its development potential and narrow its income and welfare gap with other regions of the world. The African Union has made industrialization and export diversification the centerpiece of its strategy, Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. African governments are seeking new and innovative ways to attract investment and nurture industry, implementing strategies that involve targeted investment in infrastructure, improve regional integration, and the establishment of special economic zone for priority subsectors. Under the second pillar of its fifth strategic plan, the African Export Import Bank is financing the development and expansion of industrial parks and special economic zones. It is also supporting the development of regional value chains to sustainably foster technology transfer. However, in order to reach its manufacturing and industrial potential, much needs to be done by the public and private sectors to increase Africa's economic complexity, diversity, competitiveness, and productivity. After all, to reverse the trend and to compete in an intensely globalized world, we need to take a big leap forward fueled by innovation. We also need an innovation system that can deliver new manufacturing technologies and processes to get us there. Ladies and gentlemen, at a macroeconomic level, countries across Africa are chronically dependent on aid and urgently need to turn the attention to attractive business, private investment and venture capital and marshalling innovation. But it is not all gloom and doom. Africa has the youngest population of any continent. According to the World Economic Forum, the median age among the 10 youngest countries on the continent range from age 14 to 18. We ignore this significant demographic asset at our peril. These inexorable trend trends mean that by 2034, Africa will be home to the world's largest number of working age adults. The World Bank estimates that 11 to 15% GDP growth over the next 20 years will be attributable to these favorable demographics. The energy is palpable with world-class innovation emerging from technology incubators in cities from Kigali to Harare to Lagos. Ladies and gentlemen, as we explore the best strategies to build and sustain research and development capacity for Africa's economic growth and economic and social well being, we need to look anew at how science, technology, innovation can be better mobilized to propel us 
in our journey to achieving the UN SDGs by 2030 and the Africa Union Commission's agenda 2063. Fortunately, there are many nascent success stories that we can draw upon and that need to be replicated speedily at scale. In certain technologies, in certain sectors of technology entrepreneurship and application, we know that we are pivoting to a better place. The energy is palpable. We see this most prominently in telecommunications. In 2006, according to The Economist, there were fewer than 13 million landlines and 130 million subscriptions to mobile phones in all of Africa. Today, over a billion of the continent's 1.4 billion people have access to mobile phone. These in turn have served as a platform for innovation and in the efficient delivery of services. Of particular note, of financial services and mobile money initially developed in East Africa and spreading across the continent. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, relatively few people have traditionally qualified for bank accounts. But today, everything from bananas in the marketplace to software for our PCs is purchased through the mobile money platform created in Kenya and PESA. A Frexim Bank Pan-African Payments and Settlement System, which is set to facilitate payments for cross-border trade in African currencies, will not only assuage the liquidity constraint, it will also push the boundaries of efficiency and productivity at the continent level with significant implications for growth and structural transformation. Indeed, the GSMA, the International Telecommunication Trade Organization notes that for every 10% increase in, in phone penetration in poor countries, productivity improves by more than 4% percentage point and that a doubling in mobile data usage increases annual per capita GDP growth by half a percentage point. Ladies and gentlemen, MCOPA is an energy startup built in the, on the mobile money platform, M-PESA, enabling families to purchase clean home energy in payment as small as 50 cents. MCOPA brings solar energy to more than 500 new households every day, totaling over half a million East African homes that were previously unreached by power lines. With only one in three Africans having access to energy, Energy security is crucial to fighting poverty, improving productivity, sustaining the growth of output, especially industrial output, and nurturing the next generation of scientists. Together, these families receive over 60.5 million hours of clean solar energy per month through this technology. And as a business enterprise and contributor to the economy, MCOPA, has raised well over $50 million in venture capital, providing full-time jobs to over 1,000 people and retaining over 1,500 sales agents. Paradoxically, a big factor in exemplary and appropriate technology successes, such as MCOPA, is that in many cases, we do not carry the burden of entrenched industries with vested financial interest that perpetuate business as usual, the large number of unbanked people leading to mobile-based financial services. The absence of an energy grid in rural communities invites solar energy solutions, such as MCOPA. The absence of investment telephone lines clears the path for adoption of mobile telephony and so on. Ladies and gentlemen, as these few success stories show, there is greater recognition about the role of STI can play in achieving national development goals and challenge is to maintain this momentum. Shining example of world-class innovation in Africa emerging, for example, from technology incubators, creating techies across the continent. As a result, Africa is attracting actual capital investment necessary to build industry that is sustainable in the long term, rather than further cultivating aid dependence which by its nature is short term and has never led to either the development or structural transformation of any region or country. Whether in the realm of energy, banking, communication, medicine, agriculture and irrigation, transport or manufacturing, the major drivers of growth and productivity gains have been in science, technology and innovation. And innovation 
which is increasingly treated as a deliberate outgrowth of investment in industrial research by forward-looking and profit-seeking agents has become a major piece of the economic transformation puzzle. In fact, since the 1970s, the world has moved from organization change-driven growth to technological change-driven growth. No wonder the largest corporation and companies on Wall Street have become tech companies. The five biggest companies, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Parent, Alphabet, and Facebook, account for 23.8% of the SP500 index. Technology has produced more billionaires over the last 20 years than the total number of billionaires produced during the 50 years, which followed the end of World War II. And looking ahead, the power of science technology as drivers of growth and global competitiveness is irreversible. Clearly, the link between science, technology, innovation, and economic transformation, whether at the structural or sectoral level, is overwhelming. The key policy is what are the, the key question is what are the policies, skills, and contours of the scientific ecosystem that will foster sustainable, sustainable growth of scientific and technological innovation to sustain and accelerate the process of economic transformation. Our collective mission must be as simple as it should be compelling. Boosting basic scientific research and development capacities, unleashing innovation, catalyzing change, and forging the next generation of partnership will all accelerate the transformation of African economies for greater export diversification and expansion of both extra and intra-Africa trade in a world where manufactured goods have consistently been a growing share of global trade and now accounts for over 85% of world trade. We must establish the proof of principle that world-class Pan-African science and innovation can be mobilized for tackling Africa's deep and entrenched development challenges led by Africans in Africa with priorities set by Africa for Africa in strong partnership with the international community. In this way, Africa can claim its rightful place as a global driver of prosperity for the benefit of all. How can we contribute to tackling our challenges? By building dramatically scaled up infrastructure for research, help, help create the right policy environment and supporting sound governance of institutions, and most of all, investing and unleashing the scientific capacity of people, not forgetting women. We know the best trained, most talented researchers naturally gravitate to environments where their work is leveraged by modern equipment, reliable utilities, and sufficient funding for supplies. And more critically, benefiting from the presence of other talented people. Africa's brain drain must be transformed into Africa's brain gain by creating a research infrastructure that rivals the best in the world right here at home. We must thoughtfully construct a strong foundation to train and retain our best talents, making Africa an inviting home for African research by African and international researchers. Only success will beget success. The aim is for Africa-centric investment to create a virtuous cycle of talent attracting talent boosting training and working to retain the trained talent to tackle Africa's development challenges and sustain the process of economic transformation over time. Once we build this element for sustainable science, technology, innovation environment, it will become the engine that powers our transition to a new environment where the increasing rate of economic sophistication is enhancing effective integration into global value chain for a robust and sustain economic growth as well. <coughs> Excuse me, as greater prosperity, less disease, and more scientific independence in Africa. At the same time, we must be realistic about the magnitude of our aspirations. Every step in the research ladder must be systematically reinforced. For example, today, world-class postdoctoral fellowship in African laboratories are virtually non-existent forcing our new PhDs 
with the greatest potential to seek training overseas, many of whom end up contributing to the proverbial brain drain. This is a collective loss to major subsidies to the new host country, often more industrial economies, which are always very quick to, trump, to trumpet their generosity under the debilitating aid dependent model. We must rise to the challenge by creating research universities capable of not only producing world-class science, but also serving as training incubators at the graduate and postdoc level. Ladies and gentlemen, a thriving research establishment requires a critical mass of postdoc researchers who can not only dedicate the time to in-depth research, but also provide guidance and practical training to aspiring graduate students. Universities that aspire to become competitive research institutions must attract the best trained PhD holders from everywhere in the world as postdoc to reinforce a critical thinking in the research chain, which will be an essential contributor to driving innovative outputs from these institutions. In order to recruit and retain this level of talent to create a critical mass of independent African researchers leaders, sustained funding and infrastructure, including the most modern equipment must be provided. These steps require not only research training and resources, but also the capacity to engage successfully with fellow researchers, funders, government, policymakers, communities, and other stakeholders to serve as mentors and supervisors for the next generation of scientists in Africa. Our financial goal must be easy as we need to raise funds from both the public and the private sector, a manifestation of the UN SDGs, a master plan for ending poverty, protecting the planet and ensuring that people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. The public part of this investment is manifest in the commitment of African nations to dedicate 1% of their GDP to research and development. Although the continent is far from achieving this ambitious target, the goal itself validates the belief that investment in Africa by Africa herself is essential to long-term prosperity. <clears throat> the challenges are multifaceted. There are many moving parts. Our wealth, prosperity, sit at the nexus of not just the interdependent, transdisciplinary nature of health research and our ability to and willingness to share our research outcome openly and transparently, but also in the broader context at the intersection of nutrition, health, agriculture, environment, governance, and the economy. But it can be done because it must be done. Our ability to create sustained future for ourselves isn't optional, it's existential. It may seem overwhelming, but there's an African proverb that says, if you wish to move mountains tomorrow, you must start by lifting stones today. Those dedicated to building a thriving, self-sustaining Africa, where science is the new lifeblood of economic transformation in our beloved continent, are invited to bring their stone so that we can move mountains together, starting with politicians and bankers who hold the purse, and then every young African who has the potential to be a great scientist must work hard to realize its potential for the benefit of the continent and humanity. And then the private sector must rely on African scientists to innovate and to become globally competitive to sustain the transformation of African economies. And then over time, and through a vibrant public-private partnership for economic transformation supported by African scientists, the process of continued innovation and scientific will expand the power of Africa's purse and reduce its excessive dependency on external debt financing. But creating an ecosystem where the scientific culture becomes central to economic transformation policy making decision process is a long term investment and should not be affected by either political or business cycle. Hence, to achieve a success in the path of economic transformation, effective collaboration under the tripartite public private academia partnership for economic transformation in the FCFTA era must be sustained over time. As part of my ongoing effort to use my bully pulpit for advancing the cause of STI, I contributed an op-ed in Nature, calling for a greater push to mobilize the entire potential of indigenous African plants to generate growth 
and the next generation of drugs and pharmaceuticals for tackling Africa's disease and promoting health and well being on the continent. The overall purpose is to provide a, use, a useful illustration of how strategic investment in Africa's capacity for research and development can return big uh, human and financial dividends and expand potential in the health and pharmaceutical industries, which are growth industries in Africa with tremendous potential for economic transformation. I'm pleased to know that the African Import Export Bank, our trade finance bank, is playing an increasingly important role in this critical plan pan of our economy, financing the emergence of medical centers of excellence and the rise of a vibrant pharmaceutical industry. Ladies and gentlemen, today, 60% of commercially available drugs are based on molecules derived from natural sources. As an organic chemist and biodiversity scientist, I see the great significance of this fact, especially when we consider that 25% of all plant genetic resources reside in Africa. Yet, of the 1,100 drugs marketed globally that are derived from plants, only 83 are synthesized from African species. We have left 45,000 plant species unexplored for their potential to serve as the molecular basis of pharmaceuticals and underdeveloped to potentially alleviate human suffering and drive economic prosperity for Africa. Moreover, we are in a race, we are in a race against time. Species are disappearing fast because of climate change, habitat loss, development, and other pressures. Sadly, the extinction rate of plant species on the continent is almost twice the global average, and this must be reversed. Financial commitment to exploiting opportunities to develop drugs is necessary, but not sufficient. It also requires technical, legal, regulatory, cultural conditions to enable and nurture development. Complicating matters, traditional information about the uses of plants is usually transmitted orally rather than cataloged and indexed formally. And recipes are considered trade and family secrets and so are unlikely to be shared. As an African proverb says, an elderly person's death can be like a library that is burned to the ground. For too long, we have underestimated and undervalued indigenous knowledge about our flora and fauna, yet, that knowledge can be a major catalyst for endogenous growth and sectoral transformation in a continent that is spending more than 16 billion US dollars annually on import of drugs and pharmaceutical products. Other developing countries are tackling this challenge in different ways. India has established the Ayush Ministry dedicated to the development of indigenous medical plants and systems. China is working with the WHO to catalog and document in English species commonly used in Eastern medicine. China and India are large countries compared to tiny Mauritius, but the challenges of conservation transcend national boundaries. Even though Mauritius and Nibel Islands are designated as biodiversity hotspots, almost 100 species have become extinct since the arrival of people in the 17th century, and less than 2% of the native forests remain. With the right set of priorities, even small countries like Mauritius can punch above their size by recognizing the potential of scientific research and development. To this end, I helped found what is now the Centre International pour le développement pharmaceutique, which looks for innovative ingredients for our local species, from our local species, and bring them up to international recognized standards for further development. There are several success stories of knowledge that is crossing the valley of death from lab bench to marketplace due to such efforts. A recipe from the sand people in Southern Africa has led to standardized extracts of the plant Skeletium tortuosum to be tested for their tranquilizing properties. Other extracts of African plants, including nuts of the shea tree, seed oil of the baobab, are used commercially across the globe in skin and beauty products. The challenge for ambitious initiative is to spread investment worthy ideas more widely across the continent and in various industries and sectors so that the process of economic transformation is broad based. And I'm convinced that catalyzing greater collaboration will hold the keys to success. There's an African proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. 
I hope we can bring many seedlings and shovels and plant many trees that will flower together, nurtured by the best scientific knowledge available and talents of Africa. It can be done as responsible stewards of the earth and specifically for our beloved continent. It must be done so that the benefits of STI are marshaled for greater economic, social, environmental sustainability, both on the continent and beyond. I thank you for your attention. Professor Fakim, thank you very much. Um, I tried to look on my machine to see if I could see uh, a little button that would help me to release some artificial applause button I couldn't see. So I'm hoping that in your private spaces, you can join me in uh, saying thank you very much and giving her the applause that she deserves for that very incisive talk. I will not even attempt to try to uh, capture the essence of what she said, but I did notice that she said, you, the politicians, need to work on policy. You, the bankers, need to fund this. And you, the private sector, need to create the environment for innovation that enables the use of uh, all of these things that we have within our space, the indigenous knowledge that we flash every single year, the export of our, our own talent here from the African continent. But I will not take up too much of the time because there are many questions that I see coming through and uh, we will try to accommodate as many of those questions as we can. One of the key points I, key, I see key, that keep coming back is people are asking the question, where can we see this? Please share this. I am certain that uh, the organizers will be able to share this and this is being recorded and uh, this uh, lecture is going to be shared widely. Uh, Professor uh, Amina Gurib Fakim, again, thank you very much for your time.